Hey guys, what is up? Unrested back again. And recently I've been going into this whole phase of talking about my past teaching experience to explain some of the worst horror stories. When I say horror stories, I don't mean actual scary things happening on the job as Japan is pretty safe in general. But I am talking about some of the less encouraging, uh, the less motivational, uh, the less not so fun aspects of working as a teacher in Japan. And today I'm gonna continue this streak with ALT stories, alternative language teacher. Last week I did Ikaiwa, which was English conversational school teaching with places like Nova, Gaba, any of your McDonald's-esque type English teaching shops on the street. This time I'm going with the actual public school system that Japan has and tries to use to teach English, quote unquote, teach English. Let's hop into it. Um, first of all, my first job ever teaching ALT, alternative language teaching, and uh, being an assistant to the language teacher at the school uh, was not a fun start because the first school that they put me at, they told me it was only one junior high school, which I thought junior high school, a little bit more mature, that's good. Um, I'm looking forward to it because I had just taught kindergarten and kindergartners are fine and all, but they're a little more rambunctious and there's a, more effort put on just like, you know, playtime rather than there is actual English teaching. Uh, but I get there and I'm at the first school and it turns out to be an elementary school, which I'm like, oh, all right, uh, that's a little different than what they told me. But that's fine, that's fine. I teach two or three classes and I think, I guess that's it for the day because I look at my schedule for the school and there's nothing else on the list. And the principal comes over and is like, hey, come on over to my car, I gotta drive you to the next school. And I'm thinking, the next school, what's he talking about? He drives me over to a junior high school. There I meet another teacher who is the English teacher. They show me that I'm about to teach another two lessons, I teach them. And I think, okay, so I'm split between two schools. They were right, I do have a junior high school, but what they meant is you start with an elementary school and finish the day with a junior high school. Nope. After that, the principal from that school comes over and it's like, hop on in my car, we're going to another school. Um, I get ushered into the car. We drive this long mountainous path because this school was out in the boondocks. We get to the top of this mountain and there's this quaint little almost Ghibli-esque, Miyazaki, Ponyo-looking little kindergarten on a hill, um, almost looking like the classical schoolhouse that you would see in movies about a place in the prairie. And uh, I walk in there and it's a tiny kindergarten. And I find out now I'm teaching a kindergarten lesson here uh, with the kindergarten staff. Um, I get that done and finally, that's the end of my day. So instead of one school that was a junior high school, as I had been told I signed a contract for, I found out I had three school that ranged all the way from, you know, a couple year old kids at a kindergarten on up to junior high school. Um, when I asked my contract uh, and manager uh, about it, they were just like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, you always have a little extra added on. And, you gotta make it an eight hour day, so we gotta take you around to each school to make sure you get those full eight hours in, which, okay, great, but I'm glad that contract only lasted six months. I did not resign. Um, I remember the other problem I had was that one elementary school that was on the list, um, at the end of the day, the kindergarten was closed down, I remember, because one of the kids had influenza and they'll close down the whole school when that happened. And so I was uh, done with the junior high school first and then I moved to the elementary school on that day. My schedule was a little bit reversed. And when I was there, um, the principal comes over and she's like, hey, just so you know, our school meeting today is at 8 p.m. And I'm just like, okay, uh, I'm still headed out at 4.30. That's when my contract goes to. And she's like, are you sure? She's like, the old teacher used to stay till 8 p.m. And I was just like, okay, look, my kids, junior high school, my kids junior high school, my kids uh, hoikuen or nursery school uh, closes at like five. So usually I'm all the way back there picking him up at like 4.30 or close to five o'clock, 4.45 or something. Um, I don't have money to, you know, have him picked up and sent to another 
nursery school. I don't know what you're talking about that I'm going to stay till 8 p.m. Um, I don't know where your kids are right now or who's taking care of them, but uh, this job doesn't pay enough for me to choose multiple nursery schools and have my kids shipped around. So I, I don't know what you're talking about. And they're like, okay, I guess you can go back at the normal time written on your contract. And it's just like, yeah, of course I am. And they're like, but the last teacher, he used to stay all the way till 8 p.m. And it's like, let me guess, he was a single guy with no kids um, and was really excited about this job. Great, that's awesome for him. I'm glad he had that kind of gusto, but I actually have responsibilities like a family and everything. And I know like at my kid's nursery school, for every half hour you left him past five o'clock, it was like another thousand yen added on to the price of what you were paying for that day. So. I can only imagine adding on an extra 3,000 yen at the end of each day, making it that uh, <laughs> my, my nursery school is making more money by hour than I am by teaching. Um, next up I have the sleeping teaching assistant. Um, really they weren't my assistant, they were the actual main English teacher, but one of the junior high schools uh, I had, everybody would teach English in a group of about three teachers. So there was one for each grade level. I think it was uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. That's how junior high school works in Japan. And I'd meet with each teacher, the sixth grade teacher, the seventh and the eighth. Six and seven, those two ladies had their stuff together. They had a lesson ready. They knew where they wanted to use the book that we had for class. They know what lesson out of that book they wanted to use right away. Eighth grade was a guy who, he would call me over, he'd be like, little skoto sensei choto kite. And he would show me like the lesson in the book and he'd be like, what do you want to do? That's all he would ask me. Like that was his planning. What do you want to do? And so luckily I had taught long enough in Japan at this point where I had some ideas to pull out and just be like, okay, we'll do these flashcards. I'll ask him these sentences. We can role play this English situation. And he'd be like, oh, you this, yo. Very good. Very good. Okay, good. That sounds great. Um, you take you take the reins here, Skotel Sensei. And uh, that would be it. We would get to class. He would park a chair in the corner of the class, sit down on it. Um, I would start teaching, and he would conk out. He would literally... Like, for the whole class. And uh, I remember what finally got him caught was I never narked on this guy. I never ever, you know, threw him under the bus, but I mean, this is, this is crazy. Like it's not my job to be the main English teacher in class. Um, but the, the principal from the elementary school asked me about, um, how it was teaching at the junior high school on this contract that I had with the multiple schools. He's like, how is it teaching there? Are all the teachers pretty good, right? I was like, oh yeah, I was like, pretty much, except for eighth grade. And he was like, well, what's wrong with eighth grade? And I just be like, uh, you know, he's a cool guy, but I just wish he wouldn't fall asleep while I'm trying to teach, you know what I mean? Like, sometimes I have some questions to ask him in the middle of class, like, lesson finishes early, and I'm like, did you have any other material you want to throw in here? And he's there, <sighs> asleep on his little chair, and he's like, oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not good, um, okay. And eventually, he called the principal of the other school, and they got chummy, and talked about, man, you need to probably clean up that teacher's act. I don't know what they're doing sleeping in the middle of class. So that, that was a weird one. Um, next up, I've got the glass breaking boy that coach put in a stranglehold. What a weird title for that bookmark. Um, okay, so for the most part, schools in Japan, not violent, not scary. Um, but I remember one day uh, I went to the elementary school on my contract list and I wasn't able to go over to the junior high school. And I asked them why, what had happened that day that I wasn't allowed to go? Are people sick? Like I said, if they get influenza, too many cases of influenza, then uh, they pretty much shut down the school. Well, it turns out, no, it wasn't that somebody was sick. They actually had an incident with a student. So apparently one of the students got so angry in a class because when he was late, they closed the door and uh, they don't let you into class. Like if you try to hang out in the hallway and not go to class or just diddle daddle and don't get there, they would lock the door and then not let you in. Um, schools in America, we somewhat have 
a way of doing that, but usually you have to let the student in, but they have to come in once they have a tardy slip to hand you. But in Japan, they just didn't have that. They just locked the door and were like, no, you can't come in if you're late. And that's what they did to one student who was notoriously late all the time. This kid was a bit of a troublemaker to begin with. I remember him being quite rowdy in class and sometimes throwing paper balls at the English teacher. So anyway, he's pissed that he's not allowed into the class. And instead of just going to the principal's office and reporting what happened and getting, I guess, the blue slip, yellow slip, whatever the slip color was that he needed to get to hand to the teacher to show that he has detention now for missing class, he decided to start banging on the window and he broke a piece of the window off, grabbed it, decided to use it as like a shank and was about to go up to the English teacher when luckily the coach of the school uh, zoomed in, grabbed him and put him in a stranglehold and then sent him, I guess, to the police after that. Um, if, if you don't know this, this is kind of a weird one. The principal isn't the overall enforcer. There's no dean of students that comes around and yells at kids either. Usually it's the coach of the school who is the scary um, sort of disciplinary guy. And also they act kind of like the dean. And also they, they can still get physical with students. Um, I don't know if there's still corporal punishment in schools. But I know they can and are allowed to restrain students, where in America there is ways that administration, not me as a teacher, but administration are allowed to restrain students. But uh, as a teacher myself, I'm not allowed to do anything like that. That wouldn't involve me at all. So a very different aspect of the Japanese teaching system. Let's see. Um, oh, here's a good one. The elementary school kid who went to jail for middle school. This was a weird one. So, uh, totally different school I ended up working at, an elementary school that, um, it really kind of grew on me. I really liked this school. It was, had to be one of the most poor schools in all of the area that I was teaching in called OG. And they didn't really have much. They made do with what they had. The teachers there were dealing with um, a certain uh, group called the Burakuman, and the Burakuman are what is considered untouchables in Japanese hierarchy of jobs and uh, I guess just the hierarchy of civilization in general. It's kind of really discriminatory. I don't approve of this whatsoever, but it is a tier of hierarchy that exists in the echelon of Japanese society. And these are usually the people who work like the lowliest jobs in all of Japan. And the kids who come from these families same thing they're considered Burakuman too and they don't have a lot like they have like not even enough money to like have any kind of uniforms any kind of books uh, they don't usually pay any of the fees for anything that public school asks for and public school does ask you to pay quite a bit even though it's free quote unquote you usually have to buy like a land sale backpack uh, you have to buy the books for the school you pay for school lunches etc um, etc et but these these kids would come in and just like they had like just random clothes you'd see from like Juice Co and stuff like that. And I'm not looking down upon this whatsoever. These are people, you know, struggling with what they could make at the time. I'm just letting you know what the atmosphere was and where the school was located. Um, these were some rough, rough situations with these kids. And there was one kid in particular who would refuse to go to class. And the way he would refuse to go to class was when it was time for school, when it was time for classes to begin, the bell would ring, as you have, um, and he would come to the teacher's office and try to hang out with the teachers in the teacher's office, which I always thought was kind of strange because if you want to be like the bad boy, the disciplinary problem of your school, usually your first thought is, let me go hang out in the teacher's office. And if you don't know the way Japanese schools work, um, Yes, as a teacher, you do have a desk and a podium in your classroom, but that's not actually considered your classroom or your desk or your office area. Um, the classrooms are switched up quite a bit. Your actual base of operations is a desk in one very large teacher's room. All the desks are lined up from every single class, every single level, every single subject in a row that are in front of the principal who sits at the front of those rows. Usually the principal, the vice principal, and usually one other administration person. I've, it changes school to school. I don't always remember who it is. 
and you would come in there to get all your work done, your projects finished, your lessons ready, and that kid would always come in there to hang out, I guess just ask teachers what they're up to and stuff like that, and when the bell rang, he would not go to class. Um, what would happen is the teachers would try to coerce him, they'd be like, come on now, you know, time's up, we're gonna leave and go to our classes, so you need to go into yours, and he just wouldn't, he wouldn't go. And again, they had to get the school coach involved. And this guy, you could tell, was just tired. He had just been through this so many times. So he'd be like, come on, let's go. He would start out by pulling the chair that the kid was sitting in and dragging him by the chair. And then the kid would stop him by holding on to desks and stuff like that. Um, and so he would like pick him up from underneath the shoulders and try to grab him. And then that kid would try to stop it even more by like knocking stuff off of teacher's desk, like dragging everything off of their desk and not go to class until he finally dragged him out the door. And I remember seeing one time where the kid fought him so hard that he had to put him like in some kind of hold up against the hall. And in the hallway against the wall, this kid's like held up there like this. And he's like, dude, you need to go to class. What are you doing? Like, this is ridiculous. And I just thought like, wow, that's a really tough kid to deal with. And funny enough, the teachers I worked with, um, every three years in Japan, they usually get shuffled around and put into a new school. So that's what happened to them. A couple of them were shuffled around and put into a junior high school. And I just so happened to land a job at one of the junior high schools. One of the teachers there got shuffled to. And I thought, this is crazy. She's from the elementary school I used to teach at that had that kid. And now that kid should probably be about the age of junior high school. And I asked, where is that kid who always used to be like pulled off the class all the time by the coach? And she's like, oh yeah, he didn't get to go to middle school. And I was like, why not? What did he decide to do instead? She's like, he's in jail. And it was apparently like for stealing skateboards out of a skateboard shop or something like that. Maybe skateboard parts or something, but whatever, he was arrested and in school by middle school. I'm like, that's crazy. You don't you don't really hear those kind of stories much in Japan. There isn't kids who end up so bad they're in jail by the time they're in middle school. So that was kind of a shock to me. I didn't expect that. Um, there is the school that looked like it was from Silent Hill. This is kind of the same school I was just talking about, the really poor Borakuman school that was in OG. Again, you know, my hat's off to the teachers there who strive to keep teaching even though they were given like the worst situation ever. This school looked like it was from Silent Hill because I mean there was just like broken everything there. I remember specifically um, the tiles in the ceiling. Uh, they were all like hanging down like kids had obviously thrown stuff at them or like run and jumped and tried to like hit these tiles in the ceiling so like some of them were hanging down and stuff. Lights were broken in the hallway. Um, there was one section of the hallway where they had kind of like a um, a waiting area, I guess you would call it, for parents who would come and wait for like teacher-parent meetings. And that area, instead of having like the usual nice couch, uh, the trophy case, uh, the school artwork and stuff that most schools had in that little waiting area, they just had broken furniture in there. Anything that had been broken by students had been like pushed into that corner. So it was just like, this haunting corner of uh, absolutely wretched students and what they had done to the, the entire classroom, the stuff inside the classroom. Um, it was nuts. It was just such a kind of downtrodden, barely pushing on school. And I really feel for all the teachers teaching there. They were some good people though. They were fun to talk to. Um, Let's see, next up it says some of the goofy practices at the school such as leave early but don't leave early. Turn on the AC but leave it at 30. Bring me a lesson but don't teach, just repeat words. That's what I have written for some of the goofy ways the school operated. Um, so leave early but don't leave early. Um, it was weird, there were schools where you would go to and your contract would say you're from there from 8.30 till 4.30. Um, and some of the schools would have you come in and teach your lessons. You've got like two or three for the day, um, usually already laid out and you know which teacher you're teaching with and where you're going to teach and you do that, you follow up with them, prepare your lesson and go and teach. Um, and some schools were really cool that were like, okay, you're done with your lessons for the day. If you stay here in the teacher's lounge, you're literally just gonna be sitting here doing nothing for the rest of the day. Just go home. 
and school after school you would go to would usually do this. And some would even say like, yeah, our policy here is once you finish teaching, um, you just head home. You don't need to stay around here until 4.30. Um, by that time, you know, the train schedule has switched. It's later to pick up a train and you're fighting the traffic and there's just no reason for you to be sitting here while we're trying to have teacher meetings. And there was one school that did that. They told me that from the first day. And so every day I'd finish my lesson. I'd get done with the last one on the list and head on out the door and go home. And one day my manager calls me and he's like, hey, have you been heading home early every day? And I'm like, yeah, right after I finished my last lesson. He's like, uh, the school complained to me about that. They don't want you heading home after that. I'm like, but the principal told me like that's their policy, just like it has been at like the last three schools I taught at. And he's like, yeah, you know what? You're probably right. He probably did tell you that. And also they don't really pay you enough. So, ah, you know what? Just keep heading home early. That's what my manager said. So I just kept doing it and the school never ever spoke to me about it, but apparently someone had complained about it. So it was like head home early, but don't head home early. It didn't really make any sense. Um, next up, we've got turn on the AC, but leave it at 30. During the summer, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but a lot of classrooms don't have air condition. And it gets sometimes as hot as 40 up to 48 degrees in these classrooms, which in Celsius is incredibly high. Um, look it up sometime on Google if you can't convert Celsius to Fahrenheit. It's super high and the only place that ever had air condition was the teachers lounge the teachers meeting area whatever you want to call it the thing I just told you about that has all the desks in front of the principal and all they would turn it up to or I should say turn it down to was 30 now turning your air condition down to 30 when it's 40 degrees outside feels like no different like you can't even feel like, you know that wonderful feeling of you're out in super hot weather, you walk in and there's this rush of cool air and you start to immediately feel better. There was no such thing in Japan. It was just like, go to hot, that you're sweating and like dehydrated and burning up into a room that's like just slightly less hot and you're sweating and you're burning up and you're still super thirsty. Um, there was no like, water area there was no water cooler there was no like water fountains i would just have to remember to bring a big old bucket of water with me every time i would go to these places because you would never stop sweating and the worst with me is i'd have to wear long sleeves all the time because of the tattoos now i realize that's my fault and that's on me but all the other teachers there were wearing long sleeves too and just like sweating profusely like i remember there was one school where every day I'd come in and I don't know what the guy's job was, what he did, but he would just sit in front of the fan and look like he was about to collapse. There was like a fan blowing back and forth and he would just sit in front of that fan all day with his head down like, oh, looking like he was about to pass out. It was so hot. 30 degrees on an air conditioner couldn't even keep you cool even if you stood perfectly still or lied down. Trust me, most of you would be incredibly uncomfortable in that level of heat. All right, let's take a look. Next up we've got, um, bring me a lesson but don't teach. That's the other policy that a lot of schools had. Bring me a lesson but don't teach. So every day I'd meet with another teacher and find out what I was supposed to be teaching for the day. Um, a lesson like how to take a taxi, which I mean, it makes no sense. None of the kids in this class are taking a taxi on their own. They're not about to visit another country by themselves at the age of like 12 or 13 and start asking a taxi to take them around town. But that's the lessons we got because that's a lesson on directions. Go left at the library. Um, and that's all we would do is one lesson and have one person, me, just say the English words from it. So. They would teach the class, the Japanese teacher would teach the class purely in Japanese, like, Kyo wa takushi no jubyo benkyo shimashou, Kyo wa skoto sensei eigo shabareiru. So today we're going to teach a taxi lesson, and Scott is going to be the teacher who will say all the English words. Go ahead, Scott, say it now. And um, that's what they would do. They would explain the whole taxi route in Japanese, and they'd be like, So at this point, we would say, What, Mr. Ackerman? And I'd be like, Turn left they're like okay great now back to teaching totally in japanese and that's all it would be like i would stand there with nothing to do the whole lesson it the time would literally like i'd be looking at my watch and be like one minute 
okay, it had to be like 15 minutes now. No, two minutes. All right, it had to be like another 10 minutes. Nope, just three minutes. Like the lessons would go so slow. I'd be like, oh my God, I'm going to be here forever saying just one or two English words and this is going to be the lesson I repeat two to three times today. No, it was so boring and the most non-interactive English lessons you have ever heard of. I didn't speak to kids in English. I didn't try to have a dialogue with them. All I would do was repeat the one or two English words that they were learning for the day. They'd just be like, okay, Mr. Ackerman, you say that word because you'll be saying it without any accent. It'll be natural English. Turn left. <laughs> That's it. Um, let's see. The teacher who, the teacher before me who was fired for trying to bike to school. That was a weird one. Um, I took a job at one school as an LT teacher. It was a junior high school. And the teachers really liked me there. They were like, man, you're the best. You're the best, Mr. Ackerman. You're so good. And I'd just be like, what are they talking about? Like, I literally do nothing special here. I come in and I say my one or two English phrases and then I go home. So why are they always saying like, you're the best, you're the greatest teacher ever. And I finally one day when they're like, that was an excellent lesson. You did so good. We really love you at this school. I'd be like, hey, I've taught this way like at every school I've taught at. I don't really feel like I'm doing any special and no one's really ever that excited. Why do you guys always say that? That like, I'm a great teacher, I'm so good and you know, always praising me for these lessons. And they're like, ah, well, our last teacher, very bad teacher. And so I was like, okay, tell me about this. So they finally explained that the last foreign teacher they had, who was the first one to ever teach at their school, um, because they had just finally implemented having a foreign teacher at their school, he apparently showed up late all the time. Uh, because he would start to take like the bus like you can in America of course and you know how you like attach your bike to the bus well he would do that and like take the bike and then bike the rest of the way which I don't see a big problem with but apparently this would make him show up a couple minutes late to work every day and then one day out of nowhere he decided he was going to stop using the bus and start just biking to school um, and apparently like this was something he would like brag about all the time but today I made it to school in only an hour and a half from where I live out in the city which that's a really long biking trip um, I don't know why he was trying to make it all the way from Osaka out to like the middle of the countryside like getting close to like Kyoto I can't imagine trying to bike out there but apparently this guy was like really proud that he could do this which great effort but apparently this was making him anywhere from an hour to two hours late to work because um dummy you can't wake up and try to bike to work if it takes you like an hour and a half on a bike or sometimes two hours so he'd end up like an hour to two hours late to work and they'd just be like what is going on and he'd be like yeah but i mean i don't have any lessons in the morning anyway so does it really matter if i show up an hour to two hours late and they'd be like, well, yeah, of course, like we still need to prep and stuff. I mean, you're still on the contract for showing up at 830. So the fact that I just showed up on time, just did whatever lesson they gave me, never tried to make an excuse for trying to show up late, which I never even showed up late to begin with. Um, they were like, wow, this guy's the best ever. He just does the job. Imagine that. All right. I think we're going to end it with this last part here. Um, examples of how English language learning and the media attached to it just never works. So as you probably know already, Japan does not speak English very well. Um, they are the lowest English literacy rate in all of Asia. And I'd say number one, the biggest problem is just they don't teach English in English. They teach English in Japanese where they'll explain the sentence structure diagram a sentence or explain what they're about to say in English all in Japanese before speaking even one lick of English which is just not the way to learn a language. Immersion is key. You actually have to use it in class. Um, but not only that, the other thing that really kind of takes them down a notch is the fact that they keep using the same book that has been used since 1950. Um, it is the most garbage book ever and they keep saying hey like this isn't such a bad book because we update it every year and when they say they update it literally all they do is change the title of the book while I was working in Japan there was let's go that was the first name of the book hello friends that was the next name hi friends big change there 
Um, and then there was also with the junior high school kids, there was the Crown English, and that book was half Queen's English and half HML North American English. So there was like no consistency between anything that was taught. Um, you can't mix Queen's English and North American style English. All the rules will keep changing. Um, grammar rules change. How things are even spelled, like color with a U and not with a U, keeps changing. And that was what The Crown did. It was such a piece of garbage book. And Hi Friends, Hello Friends, and Let's Go, which were all the same book, but just given different titles as they decided to say, like, oh, we've, we've changed things up. We've really changed up the system here to really create something totally new for the elementary school kids. It was such a useless book. It taught things from other countries that had nothing to do with English. Literally, one lesson was just like how to say hi in 13 different languages. And I would be in charge of teaching that. And some of them, I'm just like, I don't, I've never even heard this way to say hi from this country. I remember from somewhere in Africa, Jambo is saying hello. And that was, I think, South Africa. And it's just like, that, that's great that that's the word they say to say hello, but what does this have to do with English? Um, you know, like, hola from Spanish, we teach that one too, but it's like, I'm not a Spanish, I don't, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing these correct. Why am I the one teaching this? And why are we learning it in multiple languages when we haven't even learned English yet? This doesn't make any sense. There'd be like another lesson about flags from all over the world. Like, do you guys know these different flags? And it's like, this seems more like a history lesson. Why am I teaching, you know, like not history, but like social studies or like international world history or something. Like, why am I teaching this as an English teacher? Flags from different countries. Most of these countries I've, I, you know, some I've barely heard about. There's 192 countries that have nothing to do with my country or my language. Well, what are we doing here? Um, so, and on top of it, just some of the media they would attach. And this media never changes. When I say media, I mean like songs, movies, um, excerpts, magazines, articles. They wouldn't change. And they've been like the same for like decades on end. So for example, um, one of the songs they would try to learn English from was Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas. You know, very popular around uh, kids in junior high school right now. All of them are singing that song, right? They, they love Mariah Carey. No, no one, no one cares about Mariah Carey, especially a kid like decades, born decades and decades after that song was ever a hit, who lives in Japan and has no idea who Mariah Carey even is. Um, the Beatles, I Say uh, Goodbye, I Say Hello, You Say Goodbye, that song, well, I guess that's the title, I don't know, I'm not a huge Beatles fan, but, you know, great for, like, my dad, he loves the Beatles, but um, kids now, in this age, trying to get them to learn English, be excited about English from, with a song that old, it's just not gonna happen. Um, the Snoopy, I should say, Peanuts, the Peanuts song, Sing a Song, which is a Christmas song, but they would just teach it any time during the year, um, which was also just odd, why they're trying to teach so many Christmas songs mid-year. This is like not Christmas time that they're using these songs that are Christmas songs. And I guess it's because they're played on the radio all the time during Christmas in Japan, and that's why they're like, oh, if kids know English, they'll definitely remember some of the English from these uh, songs constantly played in the grocery store and malls everywhere in Japan. I guess that's what the idea is, like that's what they're thinking. Um, as far as movies are concerned, I don't know who chose movies that they thought were good for teaching English, but it's movies that like even I maybe saw one time and barely remembered. Like, for example, in The Crown, one of the movies they try to use to teach English with is the movie Kite Runner. Kite Runner. You guys remember that movie? It's a New Zealand movie. It's like about a girl who runs away from home and that's about all I can remember. And she's called the Kite Runner, which is like some kind of something with her tribe. A Kite Runner is somebody who has some kind of spiritual connection. Just I can't even remember the plot. How would these kids care about a movie? I think this came out in like early 2000, late 1990. And I can barely remember it. And I was alive when it came out in like the young age that was that would appreciate it. And I don't remember and I don't care about it. Uh, Free Willy, that was another one they would use to teach kids. Free Willy was like great when I was a tiny kid. I mean, that was a popular movie during that time. But kids in the year like, you know, 2010 plus, 
first of all, that movie is going to look like old, ancient garbage to them. Um, second of all, why whales? Why are we using a whale movie to teach kids English? Is, is this really the best one? Why not choose something like Home Alone if you need to choose an old movie? That would at least get kids laughing. Um, and then, oh, the the worst lessons I ever had. I guess I skipped on this one and went a little bit far ahead because it has the 13 different ways to say hi. Yeah, some of the other ones were ordering foods from different countries, like all these other foods that we don't have in America that I'm just like, okay, I mean, I can try to learn how to say these foods and hope that I'm telling the kids the right way to say these foods, but some of these I've never even had, and I, I wouldn't even know how the ordering takes place, and why am I ordering these foreign foods in my native language of English when if you were actually in the country that served these, you'd be speaking their language and knowing how to properly pronounce these foods. Why is this a lesson for me? Um, let's see. Oh, and then finally, last but not least, uh, the singing part for elementary school, head and shoulders, knees and toes. They're still using that, which is like, that's a great song for kindergartners, but elementary school, those kids don't want to sing those songs. Um, if you're happy and you know it. And I remember the funniest things were we had to also sing Hokey Pokey and Skinamarink. And I remember almost every school I ever went to, the two big questions I would always have is, Mr. Ackerman or Skoto Sensei, what is his skinamarink. It's like, oh, it's just a made-up word. What is a hokey pokey? Oh, it's just a made-up word. There is no such thing as a hokey pokey or a skinamarink. And the kids would look at me like, why are you teaching us gibberish? Why are you teaching us words that aren't words? What is America? What is learning English? Why are we learning garbage words that we can never even use in a sentence in a song that we need to memorize it? Like, it doesn't... I completely agree with you kids. I don't know either, and I don't know why in elementary school you are still studying songs that are clearly made for a kindergarten-based audience. Anyway, that's it. That's a couple more of my horror stories. I think about 10 in there um, that let you know a little bit more about uh, the teaching that I had to go through in Japan, or the edutainment, as I call it, that I had to go through in Japan. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback on these guys. The best part of my last video I did was my fellow teachers coming in there and telling me their horror stories as well. They were just mm, absolutely excellent. Beautiful stories, I loved them. Had me laughing all the way through. Just some of you guys' comments on the last lesson. Uh, please, please comment on these two. The, the ideas and the funny uh, predicaments you guys talk about or your insight on how goofy some of the teaching is is hilarious. You guys have me rolling with laughter. Um, one thing I do want to do though before we end this video is I gotta give a bunch of new members some shout outs because I got quite a few more. We've got Blind Man Travels, Jonah Slocum, Ida Q, Ice Cold, Reinhard or Die Trying, Trek Nick, I Am Sandpaper, Un Aloki, Aaron Spooner, Andre Sanchez, Sprinkly Donut, and Smile Kita 13. And I need to do one extra special thing. Andre Sanchez and Ida Q are, oh, and Blind Man Travels are all of the Kohai level membership. So guys, look out for your membership video coming out tomorrow. You can join us on the members only uh, Discord. And there's some other great things coming up as far as seals and stickers that will be attached to what you can say and do in the comments as far as being a member is. If you too want to be a member and get an extra video every single week, it literally starts as low as $1.90. And uh, I would love to see you on that list. Guys, if you like what you saw today, please like, comment, subscribe. It helps the channel immensely. I am far, far lost as far as the algorithm is concerned. No one will ever find my videos in a search or a browse ever again because I really don't get that many views or that many comments, or that many likes or subscribers anymore. I do have a loyal group of you guys who stick with me through all this and keep me motivated to keep making these awesome videos that I love to talk with you about. And uh, I look forward to you being in the next video, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.